tell my students I'm working without a net. I have no net this in here. <laughs> Try to wing it. Um, nowadays, the ultra-modern is just a theme. But a long time ago, before most of you were born, uh, it, was an actual, it was actually an authentic uh, aesthetic attitude. And here we have a house that you probably recognize here in Valdosta. It was an ultra-modern house of 1899. And here's the ultra-modern house we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, Valdosta's first total electric house, uh, designed in 1950 and completed in 1953. This is the Nichols House. Um, the Nichols House is one of uh, a, a very small number of ultra-modern buildings that uh, survive in Valdosta. Um, and what are the characteristics of ultra-modern uh, architecture? It, uh, such architecture tends to uh, use uh, uh, very unusual geometries, uh, experimental materials, and, uh, and or, I should say, uh, uh, innovative approaches to the organization of space in order to make a statement uh, concerning the relationship of the present to the future. In general, ultra-modern architecture is a very future, forward-looking, futuristic um, attitude toward design. <clears throat> the Nichols House is not just a piece of ultra-modern architecture, it's also a very unusual uh, piece of uh, a kind of California import uh, into uh, South Georgia. It is a Western home, what, in what around 1950 was called a Western home. Uh, George and Beverly Nichols moved to Valdosta in, I believe it was 1942. Uh, George Nichols had been tapped by his uncle J.C. Nichols to come and run uh, a plywood factory that um, Uncle J.C. had uh, uh, decided to set up here. Uh, J.C. Nichols uh, was one of the world's uh, uh, most important early manufacturers and brokers of plywood, and uh, his establishment of Valdosta Plywoods here in Valdosta in 1942 really represents the first uh, 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 manifestation of the plywood industry uh, here in Lowndes County uh, uh, in the sense of plywood being used for uh, furniture and building purposes rather than just basketry, which is now a more or less forgotten use, I suppose. Uh, in January 1950, uh, George uh, Nichols, who by then had moved out of the uh, plywood factory and had founded his own building supply concern, uh, which was doing pretty well, in January 1950, uh, he bought a, uh, a lot in the kind of up-and-coming Brookwood Park neighborhood, which was a, uh, a, a strip of residential lots along uh, Bay Tree Road, just west of Oak Street. And this is a lot that he bought on the corner of Azalea and Bay Tree. It's a trapezoidal shaped lot. It's actually one and a half lots uh, because uh, his neighbor to the west had uh, acquired uh, in 1941 one and a half lots for uh, his own house. So there were one and a half lots that were left over for uh, George Nichols to purchase. Um, I would suppose very soon after purchasing the lot, uh, he uh, approached Lloyd Greer, who was the longer established of the uh, uh, I should say, the longest established of the several architects uh, then were practicing in Valdosta. Um, Lloyd Greer is uh, the architect who really established architectural professionalism here in Lowndes County in uh, the early 20th century. Uh, 
Uh, Lloyd Rear, in, 19, in 1941 and 42, Lloyd Rear had hired an architecture student named Connor Thompson to work in his firm. Uh, after uh, Thompson graduated from Georgia Tech in 1946, he returned as a full-time regular employee of uh, Rear's company, uh, worked for Rear as a, uh, I guess you would say, a kind of apprentice architect from 1947 to 1950, and in 1950, he became a partner uh, in the firm of Lloyd Rear W. Connor Thompson Architects. In 1948-49, uh, uh, Greer assigned this project uh, to his young associate. Uh, it was a residence on Boone Drive, and it is uh, one of the uh, first modern houses built in Valdosta, uh, and it is a western house. Uh, I understand from Dr. Stump that they didn't realize they were getting a western house. But they did. <laughs> uh, here's another Western house that came out of the office of Boyd Rear, uh, slightly later, and probably uh, on, the, on the boards or in construction at the time that the Nicholses approached uh, uh, Rear. Uh, this was the Barham House, uh, also on Bay Tree Road, the 300 block, uh, very close to Oak Street, and it still exists uh, in uh, quite good condition. Um, one of the remarkable features of the bar house is its living room, which uh, is a see-through room that's transparent on uh, both sides, uh, giving it the effect of a kind of enclosed porch. This is a, uh, a decidedly Western uh, feature, one of the features that makes it a Western house. And what exactly is, was the point of the Western house? The point of the Western House was to facilitate indoor-outdoor living. Uh, the outdoor spaces would be uh, conceived as and used as open-air living rooms, uh, preferably uh, on the same, exactly the same level as the adjacent interior spaces. Uh, this particular house was a, a modeled house that was put up in Los Angeles in 1946 by a developer, uh, Fritz Burns, to demonstrate new ideas in home planning. Uh, it became a tourist attraction and the subject of uh, a nationwide publicity campaign. It became known to literally millions of Americans and as a result uh, uh, became widely accepted as the ideal for uh, the future of, uh, of home life in America. <coughs> Sunset Magazine, which is, uh, was uh, Beverly Nichols' favorite magazine, um, it published this article in 1949 uh, giving information on the three types of Western houses that it had been able to identify on the basis of recently published examples. Um, it showed a couple of variations of the first type, which was the ranch house type. One built around the courtyard, the other with the rooms uh, simply in a line. Uh, the second type that I identified was an H-shaped uh, plan there in the middle. And uh, finally, it identified uh, a third type, which was a kind of hybrid between the H-shaped plan and the ranch uh, house uh, that had as its advantage uh, the multiplication of outdoor spaces all around the irregularly shaped, rather rambling floor plan. <coughs> Much of the uh, thinking about modern ranch house design uh, came out of California uh, from Cliff May, whose uh, thinking about ranch houses and designs of ranch houses were often published in Sunset Magazine. In 1946, the magazine's publisher brought out a wildly successful book called Sunset Western Ranch Houses, which was reprinted in 1947 and then many, many, many times uh, after that over the years. Um, this is the book that introduced the concept of ranch house 
to architects and clients all over the country and seemingly made everyone want to own a ranch house. Uh, Cliff May, in this half, in this book, uh, is quite explicit about uh, what he meant by a ranch house. He really meant a modern adaptation of the houses that had been built on ranches in California uh, in the late 18th and early 19th century. Um, they uh, offered uh, uh, lots of light to their rooms because they were typically only one room thick, uh, lots of ventilation, and uh, lots of easy access from room to room and from inside to outside. So they were Western houses. Uh, in 1945, California Arts and Architecture published this design in its case study house series of very forward-looking house designs. Uh, uh, this was a magazine that was really had a fairly small circulation. Uh, it's maybe not self-evident that anyone living in Valdosta would have had a subscription to this magazine. <laughs> But I do think uh, that if anybody did, it was Beverly Nichols. And uh, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that she either had a subscription to the 1945 editions or that someone of her relatives in California sent her the clipping. And we'll see that in a little while. Um, uh, but anyway, this was a design for one of these H-shaped Western houses. Uh, uh, that arranged uh, uh, sleeping rooms in one wing and living rooms and kitchen and garage in another wing and connected them uh, with a motif that William Worcester favored uh, quite a lot, which was an open air covered porch opening uh, uh, in both directions to outdoor uh, spaces and on the rear uh, to a sort of private outdoor fenced living room. Uh, when Dorothy Nichols was interviewed in the 1980s, uh, the most distinct recollection that she had of working with Lloyd Greer was seeing him come to uh, their new lot on the corner of Isaiah and Bay Tree and making sketches that related to the placement of the house. I will come back uh, later in my talk uh, to, uh, in a lot more detail, to the question of the house's placement, but it seems to be beyond question that the uh, uh, quite peculiar uh, and very uh, irregular yet carefully configured outline of the Nichols' house, Nichols house's footprint was due to Lloyd Greer's uh, very um, intent study of the uh, site conditions, which included, as we'll see, not only lots of trees that were on the property, but also relationships to the adjacent streets and to existing houses in the area. This is a rendering. This is a rendering uh, that I can recognize as uh, being from a hand of Connor Thompson. Uh, quite, quite precise uh, drawing style he had, a uh, very uh, keen sense of color, and uh, this represents uh, almost the final design for the Nichols House. Uh, I believe it was probably done in the summer of 1950 because there is this, this second rendering uh, by Charles Norris, uh, uh, that cannot date any later than the fall of 1950, and it actually represents the house virtually as it was built. Charles Norris, uh, by the end of 1950, was an employee, had become an employee of Felton Davis, and I think it would be highly unlikely for the employee of one architect to be doing the rendering for another local architect. So I believe that uh, we can place the uh, design of the Nichols House uh, around uh, the uh, summer of 1950. It would have then uh, spent approximately six months uh, 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 <coughs> marinating, so to speak, in the mind of Lloyd Greer, uh, uh, his younger partner, Connor Thompson, and uh, their staff members. Here we go. 
grass people. <clears throat> this is an excerpt from a letter that Rosa Strickland wrote in February of 1952, uh, presumably on the basis of having seen uh, uh, plans for the Nichols House and possibly, or even probably, the house under construction. Uh, Dean uh, Nichols Brooks actually uh, has disclosed to me that the house was uh, under construction for almost two years. So it was probably actually begun uh, in early 1951 in order to be completed in the spring of 1953. Rosa Strickland knew something about architecture. Uh, back in the 1920s, uh, she and her husband had commissioned Greer uh, to design their house on Patterson Street, which at the time was the most modern house uh, in Valdosta. It is now, if I'm not mistaken, in the office of Lego Walton. Uh, Drive by to see that. Um, anyway, in her letter, she mentions that she had gone to see Beverly Nichols and that her new house was going to be the very last, was well, going to be the last word. And <laughs> really, Rosa was an expert in. Knew what she was talking about, and 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 here it is once she got once she got to see it finished. Uh, this is a photograph made uh, probably within the first six months of the house's completion, uh, and uh, 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 among the things that she notes is that the yard looked like it had been growing there for five years. Uh, uh, Beverly Nichols was a devoted uh, gardener, a member of the garden clubs in Valdosta, uh, uh, and horticulturalist. And uh, it, it seems that uh, she knew from the get-go that in accordance with the ideals of Western planning, her garden was going to be just as important as the house itself because the house and together and the garden together would be what would support the Western lifestyle uh, in which she intended to uh, raise her two daughters and, and, and indeed would continue to live that lifestyle for the rest of her life even feeding her children broccoli. <laughs> Here are a few uh, images of the two daughters and some other aspects of the house where you can see uh, the uh, sleekness uh, of the design, the fine finishes, uh, uh, the materials and the craftsmanship were absolutely uh, the very best that could be had in Valdosta. I, 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 I really doubt that there are uh, more than a handful of, uh, of, stru of 20th century structures anywhere in, in South Georgia uh, uh, that would match the sheer construction quality of this house. Uh, in the kitchen, in the storage wall, which was an interior design feature, one of the newfangled ideas of the 1940s that was used in the house, uh, plywood was used as a, a kind of showcase material. Uh, since the house inside and outside would be a kind of advertisement uh, for the Nichols family's plywood interests and also George Nichols' interests in the building supply trade. So everything really had to be top notch in order to make the advertising uh, value of the house uh, worthwhile. <clears throat> the house instantly became a landmark. Uh, uh, the Nicholses had barely moved in uh, when a filmmaker, Don Powership, showed up making a promotional film about Valdosta, and he wanted to take some shots, which he did, uh, in order to feature the house as representing the very uh, best that Valdosta had to offer in the category of residential uh, buildings. The Nichols House is a binuclear house. Um, this is usually results in a puzzled expression when I use this word uh, with people. Very few people seem to know what a binuclear house is. Binuclear house is, in fact, a rather uh, rarely seen uh, house type uh, in American architecture. It is an American uh, invention and is chiefly seen in American architecture. That was also uh, found in certain parts of the world that were heavily influenced by American architecture, including Australia. It's, it, it, wherever it crops up, it crops up 
very seldom. And the reason is, it was very, very expensive to build them. <coughs> As we already uh, intimated, when we looked at case study house number three, uh, the bi-nuclear house uh, has as its characteristic feature the very strict subdivision uh, of nighttime and daytime activities and uh, the housing of these activities in uh, distinct, visibly distinct, physically distinct masses on either side of some kind of linking element uh, that is then used for either trivial purposes, such as just entrance or passageway, or occasionally, and here's the case here, uh, a kind of neutral uh, 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 sitting area or den. <clears throat> it seems pretty certain that the idea of the bi-nuclear house has its origins in uh, various uh, uh, planning experiments carried on in the office of William Worcester uh, in the late 1930s and early 1940s. Uh, uh, here are several of the houses in which he investigated the possibilities of using an open porch or lanai as a connecting element between a essentially a living and service wing on the one hand and a group of sleeping rooms on the other hand. Case study house number three, which you see on your left, uh, really fits into the middle uh, uh, of the sequence of Worcester's experiments in uh, uh, residential zoning. Uh, you can see the other examples. He continued to work on the what was uh, became recognized in the mid '40s as the binuclear idea uh, uh, into the early '50s. And here you have case study house number three, as portrayed on the left uh, in a model that was published in Interiors magazine in September of 1948. Uh, this was a uh, magazine that was much more widely circulated, especially among architects and interior designers, uh, and to a certain extent among uh, uh, people like Beverly Nichols, uh, who were simply interested in interior design, and indeed who had a degree uh, in home economics, including in from Chief of State University. So she may very well have been familiar with the Interiors magazine. Many architects were familiar with it. And through this magazine, Case Study House Number 3 and many of the other case study houses uh, became, uh, for the first time, very widely known to architects across the United States. Uh, the house, the design was actually carried out finally in uh, 1949 uh, on a site in Los Angeles. The house has now been remodeled uh, beyond recognition. One of the little interesting things that I will point out uh, in the view of the house is you can see that the linking element uh, has a higher roof line than the flanking uh, service element and living element. 19, uh, in, 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 I think it was 42, uh, Worcester went off to uh, Harvard to get a master's degree in architecture. Uh, <coughs> he then stayed on and became dean of, art, of the architecture program at MIT, just down the street, stayed there in 1950. In the year 1944, he overlapped uh, with a Harvard professor uh, named Marcel Breuer. Uh, Breuer had worked in Germany at the famous Bauhaus, uh, now was uh, teaching at Harvard and uh, practicing there in Massachusetts and uh, producing in the 1940s uh, what was probably, what was, what was certainly some of the most innovative architecture uh, being done in the United States uh, in uh, many different building types, including houses. It, it, it would appear that, that Worcester and Royer had some conversations about Worcester's ideas on zoning, uh, and from those conversations, uh, Royer evolved an idea 
idea uh, for a house that he called by nuclear uh, because he had seen this word in some biology articles and he thought it was an interesting word and, uh, and it seemed to uh, capture uh, the essence of this approach to house design that he began to explore uh, in about 1944-45. His first full-fledged by nuclear house was not carried out. It was designed for a site in Miami, Florida. But the first built by nuclear house was this one, the Gower House in, uh, on Long Island. Uh, designed in 45, uh, built in uh, about the next year, and finally published in Progressive Architecture in February 1947. And in that, and, well, there you can see, it was actually kind of a three-part house. It had a, a, a completely separate wing that was kind of uh, guest, room, guest rooms and garage. Uh, but the main part of the house had, and you can see how they're labeled, daytime activities on the left, a small linking element that was nothing but a foyer, and then uh, the nighttime area uh, that was also designated uh, for children. Um, one, of, one, of the, one of the things that's, I suppose, poignant is the word about these bi-nuclear houses, is they were very much family-oriented houses. Uh, they were being uh, designed for couples with young children uh, who were looking for uh, uh, a house that would be suitable for nurturing their children. They wanted to have their master bedroom near the children's rooms so that they could uh, keep an eye on them. Uh, this, uh, as the children grew up, <laughs> this, this closeness was often seen as a drawback rather than as a In any way, this article in February 47 uh, went into great, it was a huge article, much bigger than most articles in, uh, on houses and architecture magazines at the time, went into great detail uh, discussing uh, why this was such a revolutionary idea of architecture uh, and explaining the origin of the Mind Nuclear House as Breuer conceived it. And if you want to read the paragraph, uh, you find out that it did not come in his mind out of the tradition of the ranch house, which had been the source for Worcester's ideas about by nuclear uh, landing. Instead, he, according to Breuer, it came from the idea of taking this typical example of the two-story house from right around the same time. It just came from the idea of taking the second floor off the two-story house and sitting it next to the uh, ground. That, that's what he claimed was, was the origin of his thinking about it. I'll now try to explore with you uh, some of the ways in which the Nichols House uh, participates in uh, uh, trends not only in architectural design, uh, but also larger cultural trends uh, that were going on uh, in the United States uh, in its time, the 1950s. <clears throat> to talk to tackle the architectural questions first, uh, these are is just a little kind of reminder of things that we've seen so far and looking at uh, where the Nichols House plan came from from a purely architectural historical perspective. We can consider that Worcester's uh, uh, house number, uh, case study house number three, is a kind of prototype uh, that led to uh, Breuer's production in 1945, really the same year, of the model that was widely disseminated uh, throughout the United States. And then we see in 1950, we see uh, the office of Lloyd Greer uh, uh, working on a type of house that corresponded to that model. Other architects and architecture students were also looking at the prototype and more especially at the model. Um, these were a couple of uh, designs, uh, a couple of uh, premiated designs, submitted in a rather uh, well-publicized, actually nationally publicized, 
competition that was organized by Rich's department store in Atlanta uh, in 1946 and attracted uh, four uh, winning entries uh, that used by nuclear idea. Uh, these two are both by architects from uh, the Northeast um, who had connections with Harvard. Uh, and it would seem that as early as April 1946, uh, the only way that people could have known really about uh, Breuer's uh, investigations in uh, uh, nuclear design would have been through personal connections within academia. But there you have it. Uh, to this one in particular is a very classic A-shaped, uh, uh, very Breuer-esque uh, plan. Another competition, uh, quite famous in national public science, was organized in 1947, published in 1948 by the Chicago Tribune. Uh, and uh, this competition was looking for uh, solutions to the problem of uh, houses on tight urban lots. Uh, three of the uh, uh, best designs in this competition used uh, the uh, by nuclear idea in really quite creative ways because the lots were so tight and uh, the original, as Breuer conceived it, or uh, even as Worcester had conceived it, really called for an expansive kind of house on acreage, not on a skinny little city lot. But there you have it. You can sort of see uh, architecture students and young architects really struggling to uh, make the best possible use of this very uh, uh, revolutionary idea in planning that had obviously uh, captured their imaginations. The first by nuclear house to be built in the southeast uh, was this work by Paul Rudolph uh, from 1946-47. It was the Denman residence in Siesta Key. Uh, and it is a rather uh, classic, uh, uh, very characteristic version of the by nuclear house with a uh, Worcester right porch uh, forming a linking element between the sleeping zone and a uh, daytime uh, and uh, service zones. <clears throat> it, it, it would appear that Breuer, whose work was much more widely publicized than Worcester's ever was, um, that uh, it was Breuer's designs that really um, affected architects across the country. And here you see an example back in California from uh, 1948. This is a, a house in Marin County that uh, was, is almost, almost a plagiarism of, of Breuer's Geller house. Very, very close correspondence there. Just show you a few other ones. Here's another California example uh, that also, uh, to my eye, seems to, uh, ironically perhaps, uh, show more of an East Coast influence than the local West Coast uh, influence. Um, Georgia, for reasons that are not very clear to me, uh, Georgia, except probably Probably the answer is that there were uh, strong connections between Harvard and uh, Georgia Tech, and, and, and therefore Atlanta, uh, rather early, uh, which is to say 19, uh, late 1940s, mid, mid to late 1940s. Anyway, uh, Georgia uh, uh, is among the states uh, that saw a lot of, of the early diffusion of the binuclear idea into actual practice, uh, resulting in actual examples of binuclear houses uh, being built. Uh, this are two of the surviving binuclear houses uh, in, uh, in uh, two areas, two neighborhoods in Atlanta, in which Fitch and Barnes, uh, local modernist firm, uh, designed uh, by nucleus. Another architect working in Atlanta uh, who was uh, captivated by the uh, by nuclear idea was Andrew Steiner. Uh, he built uh, several houses in a single neighborhood that he 
developed, uh, including his own house, which you see in the middle there. Um, and uh, they're all the houses in the neighborhood are not like here, but uh, quite a few were. And uh, uh, many of the others were kind of uh, halfway by nuclear in their planning. Here's just an example to show you something from further afield. This is my nuclear house, uh, also from 1953, uh, in a suburb of Chicago. Here's another one in Georgia, an uncertain date, probably showing, I would think, Midwestern taste. Not very much is known about this house. Uh, in fact, it's hard to find out about my nuclear houses because you can't always tell from driving down the street whether you're looking at one. Uh, I'm corresponding with several people in Athens um, about this house, and nobody really knows for sure how it's planned inside. The suspicion is that it's a my nuclear house, but we're guessing. This makes it a little hard to understand the significance of any one particular my nuclear house because it's Hard to, hard to see the full extent of the population of this building. Uh, this is one of the most remarkable examples in Georgia. It's unfortunately been uh, quite a bit remodeled, so it doesn't look uh, like a characteristic by nuclear house anymore. Uh, but it was built in Macon in 1954, and with its butterfly roof, uh, shows a very definite influence of Royer. Uh, this is a uh, I don't know, one on which research is ongoing. This was in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, has been officially dated as 1953 and associated with the office of Robert Overstreet. Uh, however, uh, the latest research suggests that the house was designed uh, uh, closer to 1953 and uh, was a moonlighting job by a couple of Overstreet's draftsmen. We shall see how that works out. Um, over the last two months, I've done my best through literature review.